3.1, numeration systems. We started this last time and we had three numeration systems wrought with problems, right? Oh my goodness. What numeration systems, without looking, just look at me. What numeration systems did we do before? Do you remember? Babylonian. Egyptians, Babylonian. Babylonians, Mayans. and Mayans. You bet, those are the three we've done. And um, some have more problems than others, but they all had things about them that made them obviously not what we use today, right? And we're moving on today into a system that still exists in some ways today called the Roman numerals, or the Roman numeration system. All right, before I write anything down with you, where have you seen Roman numerals today in real life? Clocks. Clocks. The Super Bowl numbers. The Super Bowl numbers. Um, the you know books. That? Books. People. Like a table of contents. Names, right? The first, the second, the third, and somebody's names. Yep. What's that? Shakespeare. Shakespeare. So in reading, yeah. what did you say? Plays. Plays. Right. Uh huh. Sometimes you'll see them in outlines. Have you done outlines? It's been a long time since I've done an outline, but I know we used to use Roman numerals in our outlines. Um, can I tell you another cool place where I found uh, Roman numerals used a number of years ago? Um, is that Oklahoma is not a very old state. Y'all know that, right? We're not old. Um, but there are states along the East Coast that are old states, and there are buildings that are actually have the established dates and Roman numerals on the buildings. So that's kind of cool. Um, and I have an example at the very end of class two. Remind me, my last slide, it's after my last slide, of somewhere that I've seen, that I have seen Roman numerals recently, like in the last couple of years, and I'll share you that picture with you then. So some of these are very familiar numbers to you. Some of them are less familiar, because if you do an outline and you get to M, I'm really, really sorry for you. That would be terrible. Does anybody know what the M equals? It's a thousand. And if you had a thousand point outline, oh my goodness, it would be terrible. Or a thousand parts, you know, chapters of a book or something like that would not be good. So some of these are less common than others, um, but some of them are super common. So let's go through them. The first one, I. What's it worth? One. One. <coughs> What's a V worth? It's worth five. An X? Ten. Ten. All right, those three we see a lot, even now. After that, not so much. I mean, we got the, the clock faces with those on them, right? Mm -hmm. So let's see what you can remember or maybe deduce what happens next. What do you think L might be? It's 50. It is, it's 50. Can I look at what's going on with the values? 1, 5, 10, 50, 100. Patterns, right? It is. The next one, the letter C, or the number C, is actually worth 100. So what do you suppose D is worth? 500. 500. And we already said that M is 1,000. Now let me pause right here to um, sort of give you a heads up. I know we're nowhere near the next test, but just so that you know, when you get to the next test, you get this sheet of paper. And this sheet of paper has all the numeration systems symbols on it. So I don't want you to waste time and space on your note card with symbols. This will be there. Everything else about the systems, you know, the, do, they have a, do they have, you know, like a place value system or is it base 60? All that's not. But the symbols are on here. So symbols are not something you're going to have to write. Does it have the values on it as well? Yes, the symbol with the value. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. And I'll pass this around when we get to the, closer to the test so you can actually see it too. But just an FYI, that happens. All right, there are a couple of properties um, at play in the numerals with the Roman numeration system that are very different than any of the other systems that we have seen. One of them I know you're aware of. The other one you may not be aware of. So the first one that I know you're aware of is what I'm calling the subtraction property. So to avoid repeating a symbol more than three times, what the Romans would have done is they would have put a smaller value in front of a larger one but they will only go one smaller than the values. So this property will only affect fours and nines. Okay, if the number was four, we would not write four I's. If the number was nine, we would not write a V and a four I's, right? It's a minimizing of symbols. And if you think back to our friends, the Egyptians, that was part of the biggest problem in their system, right? I don't want to write 99,999 with their symbols and write each of those symbols nine times. 
that's kind of what this is sort of eliminating, is that repeated symbol business. So, if we wanted to write 90, we would actually write an X, uh-huh, and then a C. So here's the deal. The X is worth 10 and the C is worth 100. Since the smaller value is coming before the larger value, it's a subtraction. 100 minus 10 is 90. But it affects 90. The kicker when you do 99 is what you cannot write. So if you write this down, I want to make sure that you write the word can't next to it. You can't write IC. It'd be really friendly and nice, and in our minds that might make sense, right? One taken away from 100 would be 99. But it's not what the Romans did. Our goal is not to take their system and tweak it. <laughs> our goal is to use the system the way that they used it. So what would they have done? So this is a no-no. They didn't do this, all right? So what did they do? Well, they broke the part, the 99, up into 90 and 9, okay? 90 was XC. 9, I suspect you've seen before, is what? IX. 1 before 10 makes 9. So their symbol for 99 is XCIX. Okay. It's always one digit smaller. So let me go back to my screen before where we had all their digits on there. So in other words, the only thing that I can take away from a 10 is a 1. The only thing that I can take away from a 5 is a 1. They go all together. They're like in a group. Okay. But the 100, I can take away a 10 from 100. I can take away a 10 from a 50. It can only go back one sort of, you know, digits worth, basically. If I'm looking at my 500s and my 100s, the only thing I can take away from a 500 or a, I'm sorry, 500 or 1,000 is a 100. I can't take away 10 from 100. I didn't say that right. 10 from 1,000. All right? I can't do that. It doesn't work like that. So we're going to do, oh, there's one more, one more um, that you probably haven't seen. Um, just like with all of our other systems, we talked about what happens when the numbers get big. Because this, I mean, 1,000 is bigger than, say, like 10. You know, one of our other place values, the biggest digit they had looked like a 10 or looked like 5, the bar in Mayans, right? So this is, like, better in terms of that. Um, but they don't have a place value system like that either. So what do they do when they want large numbers? Well, they have a multiplication property. They will have a bar that's placed over a Roman numeral to multiply it by a thousand, and they will put a double bar to multiply it by a million. For example, 9,000. Okay, so I'm not I'm drawing this sort of a, a bar to separate. I want to talk about the number nine. How do I write the number nine? IX. And the way I make the 9, 9,000, is by putting a bar on top. If I put a double bar like this on top, this would be 9 million. Okay, double bar means millions, single bar means thousands. So, we are going to take a numeral and look at the number before and the number after. MCMX. <clears throat> okay, so just like when we were looking in the other systems, it's always the furthest or the smallest place value that's affected when we increase or decrease by a number one. So which one, which symbol here is going to be affected if we increase or decrease by the number one? The X that's at the end. <coughs> And the X at the end is the number, whoops, is the number 10, right? Let's actually write these out just to remind ourselves. What's the M? 1,000. What's the C? That's 100. What's the M? 1,000. So I have 10 at the end. So if I want the number that comes before this, what will I have to do to the X or the 10 value at the end? Right, so we would have the same MCM as before, and then I'd have IX. That's how I write the number 9, IX. 
And if I want the number at the end to be increased by 1, what would I do? Would you do xi? Yeah, you will do xi. MCM xi. That will make it an 11 at the end. Now, we're going to figure out what this value actually is in our system. Now, I've already written out some of the digits of it. This is 1,000, this is 100, this is 1,000, and then this is 10. And if there's any places where, when I'm moving from left to right, I see a smaller value in front of a larger one, which is exactly what happens here, that's subtraction. So this 1,000 at the beginning is addition, and the parts that I circled in red would be 1,000 minus 100 because the 100 comes before the 1,000. So what's 1,000 minus 100? 900. 900. And then I have 10 at the end. So in total, what do I have on this value? 19. Yes, I have 1,910 or 1,910. which could be the date of a building, 1910, right? Good. Mm -hmm. My husband's brother was actually married in the church where George Washington's funeral took place. Mm -hmm. Think that's right. And so it had a date like this on the building. That's when I actually saw this, which was quite a while ago at this point, but dates on buildings. All right, we're going to go the other direction now. We're going to take, in this case, a very large number because I wanted you to see what we would do when the numbers get large. And we're going to write it in Roman numerals, okay? So the number being bigger than 1,000, oh, let me make one comment about numbers. So M is 1,000, MM is 2,000, MMM is 3,000. Everybody good with that so far? But I can't put four Ms and make it 4,000, right? because I can't do more than three digits that are the same in a row. So I can do just fine with 1,000 without any bars, with 2,000 without any you know, multiplication, 1,000 bars, and 3,000. But once I get to 4,000, that's when I have to use lines above things, bars above things. So if I wanted 4,000, it would be the number 4 with a vertical bar above it to make it 4,000. Okay? I would not do, like, this would not be okay. Okay, with the rules the way they are, yeah, that's 3,000, but that's not how they do it, all right? So we're not, we're not changing their system. We're using the system that they already have, and they already had a way to write 3,000, so there was no bars needed, okay? Okay, so taking a look now at our value above. I have 1,492,019. So this number is definitely bigger than 3,000. Agreed? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And it breaks apart right here very nicely in the thousands place where we put our comma. So the number that's coming before that, however, 1,492, that I don't need double bars for. Yes, I realize there's a millions place. Like, I get that. But I don't need anything special with double bars to represent that because I can write 1,492 without doing anything extra. So how would I write the number 1,000? M. M. How would I write the number 400? Uh, so 500 would be a CD. CD, okay. So I didn't mean to put that there. C is, is 100 and a D is 500. So C coming before D makes 400. Mm -hmm. Okay. How about the number 90? We already did that one. Oh, yeah. XC, you bet. And then a two? Just two. I, I, right? Okay, so this is actually the number 1,492, 1,492, like Columbus sailed the ocean blue, that one, yeah. And if I put a bar above it, that puts it in the thousands place. It's not quite done, because I have more digits after the thousands place, right? I have the 019. So 019, the one means I have 10. How do I write 10? X. X. The 9 means I have 9. How do I write 9? IX. I -X. So this is what I would have in Roman numerals. Okay? I've seen people like write down 2 and 3 like this. Yeah, so, and that's fine, but that's not a bar like we're talking about. 
Um, our book doesn't use that, so she's asking like what happens when people write the number one like this in Roman numerals, and that's fine, and you can do two, and you can do three, and you can even do five like that. That's all fine. It's just, it's like a type, right? Like font, it's essentially the same thing, right? It's kind of like you write an A like this, and I might write an A like that, right? It's a font issue. It's not really an issue about it being something different. Okay. If you were writing it this way, you'd still have a bar on top of it if you needed it there for some reason, Okay. If you want, yeah, that's fine. Okay, I brought something for you guys to see. I brought base 10 blocks. So you may have seen these before, and we'll draw these on our paper here in a minute. Um, base 10 blocks are really good for kids helping them to understand size difference and place values. So with base 10 blocks, you have this little bitty one, okay? And your book is calling this a unit. You have this one right here, which is 10 of the little units stuck together. It's called a long. I'll pass these around to you in a minute. If you take 10 of these longs and stick them side by side, you have one of these looks like a square and it's called a flat. And if you stick 10 of these flats together, you get a cube, okay? So the, the benefit to manipulatives like this, and there are other manipulatives too like this, is that students are not tempted to say, hey, look, I can add this and this together and this is the number two somehow. Because they're not the same size, right? This one looks visibly bigger than this long, right? So I don't have that temptation to somehow think I can combine things that are not alike. Um, I actually have in here as well, which is a little bit even more interesting because you're going to be looking at this very quickly, base three blocks. Okay, they're wood. So my base three blocks are the same thing. A unit looks like this little brown, the little, little brown cube, right? It's a unit. If I put three of the units together in base three, this is a long, right? Ours is 10 long because we use base 10. In this system, if you were using base three, it'd be three long. And if you stuck three of these longs side by side, you would end up with a flat, okay? And if you stuck three flats side by side, you would end up with a cube, just like our massive red cube here, but it's a cube in base three. And there's actually one in here that they go one bigger and they stick three cubes side by side. There's not a name for this, but this would be one place bigger than that, one place value bigger than that. So if this represents our cube, represents the thousands place in our system, it would be the equivalent of the 10 thousands place in base three, okay? So I'm gonna pass these around just so that you can see them, feel them. If you were using this in the classroom, you would need classroom sets to make sense of this. You might not necessarily need two dimensional things. Um, you might actually be able to use this with paper, right? Imagine cutting out, you know, cardstock kind of paper or something like that, or laminated paper, where you have little bitty pieces that are one unit, and you have unit, 10 units stuck together to make a long, and then you have the flats. So this is totally something that's doable, whether or not you have the resources to purchase items like this or not. Okay, so I'm going to just send these around. In fact, I'll do this. Start these around, and then give it about five minutes, and then this one around to you. Okay, so you can just see what those look like. And this is just one version of base 10 blocks that exist out there, of course. So if you were drawing pictures of these, which is where we are now, you would be using squares and rectangles to represent these. So a unit would look like a little square, okay? A long should look like 10 of these units stuck together but we don't necessarily have to draw out the div individual divisions of them. It's just gonna look like a long piece, like a long rectangle. A flat has to look like a larger square because it's supposed to be 10 long stuck side by side. And then a block or a cube has to look three dimensional or it won't make sense, right? Oops. So this is a block. So I'm sending around base 10 blocks, those are red ones that are coming around, and I talked about the base three blocks, which are about to come around in here in a second, and they're wooden. And so we're gonna actually talk about what happens when we change the base to something else. And the first base that I'm gonna use, and it's randomly chosen, or at least it was when I created all this to begin with, there's nothing special about base eight. But in base eight, how much would a unit, a long, and a flat be flat? I'm sorry, a unit, long, flat, and block be worth? Okay, so a unit is always worth one. That's a given. 
So what do you think a long would be worth? Ten. Nope. Eight. eight. Yeah, so in base eight. 10, a long's worth 10. So in base 8, a long is worth 8. What would be flat be worth? 64. Danielle, how did you get 64? It's 8 by 8, right? It's a square that's 8 by 8 or 8 squared. So what would a block be worth? Nope, but you're close. 8 times 8 times 8. Three-dimensional. All dimensions of 8. So this ends up being 60. I'm sorry. I wanted to write it differently. 8 to the third. And I think it's 216. No, it's 512. Is that the right number? Okay, we'll assume that I might know it's on my paper right. So it's 512. Okay, so it's powers of 8 because we're working in base 8. Just like in our base 10, we use powers of 10. By the way, does anybody know why we have a base 10 number system? Why is it easy? Because actually any number system that you started with would be equally easy. But you'd have zeros in any other system too. We're about to use some examples. Nope, but they would do that in any system. Because we like the number. Mm -mm. You got it. Annika's got it. You have 10 fingers. That is really, totally, and absolutely true. Ten fingers. So why do you suppose the Mayans might have used base 20? Because they have ten, ten fingers. Ten yeah. Okay, this whole idea of wearing shoes all the time, that's not exactly Mayan style, right? Not, a, not exactly. Yeah, so they would have fingers and toes. I mean, like, literally the reason. So if we were doing base 8, that's what we would probably do if God did not make us with thumbs or pinkies or something. I mean, like, really, your pinky's not really doing you a whole lot of good. If you just had these four, you would probably be okay. You really would. Your pinky toe, not real important either. All right? Like, it'd be totally fine to work with eight, and you'd be totally comfortable with it, and you wouldn't think anything about it. So you guys are all saying, well, it's base 10 because it's easy. Well, it's easy because you've been learning it for, like, 13, 14, 17 years. I don't know. Since you started working with numbers, you've right. always used base 10, right? All right. So let's take a look at some other number systems and see what happens. Oh, let me, sorry, part B first, and then we'll do the number, the number systems. This says question B above, um, so B rather. Considering manipulatives, how many units would 2, 3, 7, and we notice the subscript written down beside it, 8, that tells you it's in base 8, B. Okay, so imagine, you've all seen my base 10 blocks coming around. About half of you have seen the base 3 blocks. Imagine that you had, this is two flats, three longs, and seven units, right? That's what this number means. But in base eight, a two flats is not 200. It's two 64s because a flat is worth eight squared or 64. Whoops. So if I literally took these little, little wooden pieces that are coming and I could break them apart like Legos, like if I could do it that way and I could break it apart, I'd have 64 little units and I would do that to two flats. Are you with me? Okay. And I'd do the same thing with the longs. The longs are worth eight, right? So I'd take each of my longs and I'd break them all apart into individual pieces and I'd have three sets of eight units. And then I'd have seven that are simply just one unit. So if I would multiply 2 times 64 plus 3 times 8 plus 7, I won't make you do it. I know you can. You'll get 159. So if I were to take these manipulatives and break them all apart into their little bitty units, I would actually have the number 159. So in base 8, the number looks like 237. But in base... 10, that's actually 159 individual units. That's the equivalent base 10 number. So it says question B above is equivalent to asking what would 237 base 8 be in base 10? Okay, 
So let's actually talk about three different number systems. Again, nothing special or specific, but just to kind of give you a feel for how changing the number system changes things. Because some of the things you guys were suggesting about repeating digits and zeros showing up, you're not aware of it, but they do that in all number systems. And they do so in a beautiful, very similar way. So let's take a look. In base 10, we have 10 numerals. Which is our smallest numeral? It's zero. We go from zero to nine. We do not have a numeral for 10. There's a number 10. It's the number one zero. It's two numerals, a one and a zero, right? But it's not called a numeral. It's a two-digit numeral. It's a two-digit number. So in base three, how many numerals do you suppose there are? Three. Base 10, there's 10 numerals. Base three, there's three numerals. But they start at zero, just like we do in base 10. So what are the numerals that follow zero then? One and two. There are no threes in base three, just like there are no tens as a numeral in base 10. It becomes a two-digit number. So in our system, when we run out of single-digit numerals, namely when we get to nine, what do we have to do to keep counting? We have to add a place value, right? We have to make it a two-digit number. And that happens the same way in any other base system as well. Once we run out of numerals, and we have very quickly in base three, run out of numerals, zero, one, two. Once we run out of numerals, we have to add a place value. And so what we do is we make the ones place or the units place a zero, and we do our first non-zero digit in the tens place. In this case, it's the threes place because we're working in base three. So after two is the number one, zero. Just supposing, what do you think might come after one, zero? Mm-hmm, and then one, two. That is the largest I can get of a one and a number after it because there isn't a three, right? So kind of like when we get to 19, what do you have to do after 19? I use zero out the ones place and you increase the others place. Here it would be two zero. I want to go a little further just so you can see it happening again. I've got two one, two two, and I'd run out of digits. And in fact, two two would be the biggest two digit number in base three. There's not anything any bigger because those are the biggest numerals in base three, taking up both place values. So then I would get to one zero zero. And I would continue the process. And if you worked in base three, you wouldn't think anything about it. All that would seem just natural, just like it seems very natural for me to ask you, what comes after 99? 100. What comes after 20? What comes after 2, 2? 1, 0, 0. Okay. All right. So let's adjust and see what happens then if we've got base 7. How many digits do you, how many numerals do you suppose there are in base 7? Seven? 7. Starts at 0. One, two. How far am I going to go? Uh huh. Six would be the biggest numeral in base seven. What would happen after six? Ten. Yeah, so we would write it as one zero, and we'll actually say one zero. Um, this is actually the sevens, is, is our place values, or reach worth seven. So we kind of don't want to say ten because ten is, assumes that we're in base ten. So we would say it's actually, yeah, seven. This would be the number seven in base seven. It's a two-digit number. It's the number seven, okay? We don't usually talk about it like that. We just say one zero, just so you know. But of course, you'd get one one all the way up to what? One six, and then it would go to two zero and on, okay? So we're not gonna write that much more of them, but that's pretty good. Oh, how is base 12 different than the bases we've already talked about? Yeah, it's actually bigger than the base 10 system we already use, whereas the other two I've given you, actually three because we talked about base 8 as well, were all smaller than the base 10 system we used. So somehow, how many digits do you think we're supposed to have to use, or numerals? i got to have 12 numerals. I mean, I do, right? got to have 12 numerals. So we still start with 0, and we still go up to 9. OK, 
Okay, and so, um, Emily, this is where contemporary math mm -hmm. and this book differ, okay. just FYI. So, um, in the contemporary math, the online contemporary math, that um, the book that's used for that, what they do next is they go into the alphabet and they use letters A, B, C, and so forth. I actually prefer that. That's not what this book does. What this book does is it uses T for 10, E for 11, and if you ever need a 12, you don't hear, but if you did need a 12, they'd use a W. Okay? It's just the convention that this book uses. T for 10, E for 11. Once you get to 11, you've run out of digits, okay, because you've got 12 digits now written here from 0 up to E, and you'd go back to 1, 0. And you'd go all the way up to 1, 9. What do you suppose would happen after 1, 9? You'd have 1, T, and then you'd have 1, E, and then you'd have 2, 0, and we keep going, okay? I'd like to pause here for just a second and ask you, where do you see other base systems used today? And don't you dare tell me you don't see any. You may not think of them right off the bat, but there are ones you see. Time. Time's a really good example. What base system do we do our time in? 60s and 12s, <laughs> right? So what happens when we get to 60 seconds? That makes a minute. What happens when we get to 60 minutes? It makes an hour. Yep. And then we do weird things when we get to hours, right? At least in the clocks that we use mostly, we do this kind of a 12 thing going on where we repeat our 12s, right? Any other examples you can think of? I will bet that, I'm going to say like 90%, but I bet it's 100% of you have a phone with you today. Do you? Yes? Um, and you've used a computer sometime recently. The coding that's done in your computer, and your phone is really a computer, is done in binary. Do you know what binary is? Either binary or hexadecimal. Do you know what binary is? Zeros and ones, ons and offs, zeros and ones, zeros and ones. It's a system that only uses zeros and ones. It's a base two numbering system. Or it's done in hexadecimal. Hexadecimal is a base 16 numbering system. Okay? You don't see it, but you use it. Yeah? You do. And we're going to encounter another example in your homework or group work. I can't remember which, and you'll see that one later. Okay, so what we're going to do next is kind of like what we did with our numeration systems in general. We're going to find the number that comes before the number that comes after. All right? Thinking about how our systems work. So if we're dealing with base 5, base 5 has numerals that go from 0 until 4. So what would come before the number 1, 5 in base 5? What comes before 1, 4? It's not a trick question. It's 1, 3. Yeah, it's 1, 3, base 5. So if I were numbering it, I'd go 1, 3, 1, 4, and what would come next? 2, 0. Because once I get to 1, 4, I can't go 1, 5. There's no 5s in base 5, so I've run out of digits, so it becomes 2, 0. Yes, absolutely. So every now and then somebody asks me a question a little bit different than what you just did. But here, you'll notice that the, the subscript's written in words. Yes, you need to write it in words. Some textbooks, instead of writing the word out, they'll actually do a subscript in parentheses with the number, like the number five in it. Please don't do that. It makes it really difficult sometimes, especially when you're not super, super neat handwriting, that this starts to look like it's a multiplication with parentheses around it beside the number. Are you tracking with me? So this is the notation your book uses, and I actually think it's probably the best notation for doing this. So we're gonna stick with the notation where the subscript's written beside it. So the only time you don't write a subscript is when you're actually in base 10. And if it helps you to write the word 10, just to remind yourself that you're in base 10, you can do that too, okay? So let's look at 12, base 12 that is. We have T00, do you remember what the T represents? It means 10. 
But just like in the other numeration systems, the zero at the end, right, the smallest unit, the units digit, is the one that's affected the most by when you increase and decrease numbers. Now, this number is the one that's in the middle, right, T00, base 12. The number that comes after is the easy number. What comes after T00? T01. The number that comes before is harder. Now let's pause for a moment and think about what you would do if I gave you the number 900 in our system, base 10. What comes before 900? Well, essentially you have to do some borrowing, right? You have to take the nine and you make it an eight and you move that over and you say, oh look, I have 10 here now, right? Oh, I'm gonna have to borrow from the 10 and make that a nine so that I have a 10 here so that I can then take something away. And when I take away the number, I end up with 899. That's really what you do when you count backwards in taking it away, is you adjust the values before to compensate. So you do the same thing in base 12. You adjust the numbers that come before. So the 10 will become a what? Nine. A 9. The 0, when you borrow it, you're borrowing 12. Right? You're borrowing 12, but then you have to take one away. So it becomes an 11, which is an E. I'm going to run out of space to write this. Let me move this over. And then, again, this becomes a 12, and you take one away. So it's also another E. So this is 9EE. -E. Yep. Base 12. the number that comes before T00 is 9EE. And if you think about it, it kind of makes sense. 9 at the beginning because it's one less than you started with. The E's are the biggest thing that you can have in base 12, just like a 9 is the biggest thing you could have in base 10. All right, we have time to do half of what's next. Well, to do the next bullet point. What we want to be able to do is we want to be able to convert. We want to be able to take our number and put it into some other base. And we want to be able to take some other base's number and put it into our number. Those are the two directions that we want to go. So we're going to do one of those directions today, and then we will do the other direction next class period. So this is taking some base, I don't care what it is, and turning it into base 10. And the reality is we already did one of these. We did it right here. We took a base 8 number, and we turned it into base 10. And we talked about physically what that is, is breaking apart all these little blocks, right? So, if we were to take a base whatever number and turn it into base 10, we would put the numerals into expanded form. So we would write them out next to what each of their place values is work, just like I did with the base 8 numbers a minute ago. And then we multiply it out. Okay, it's always, it's a multiplication step to put something from some other base into base 10. It's multiplication. So we're going to do two examples. We're going to do an example in base 2 and an example in base 12. So each of these numbers, I'm just going to space it out. There are four digits, a couple of them are zeros, are in the base 2 system. In the base 2 system, it's all powers of 2. It's so always the unit's value, and then 2, 2 squared, 2 cubed. It's powers of 2 because I'm working in base 2. Okay? So what you're going to do is you're going to multiply the value times the value of the placeholder. So in the first placeholder, I have the number 1, and its value is 2 cubed. It's the 2 cubed place. And for the sake of just writing them out, I have a 0 in the 2 squareds place. I have a 2, I'm sorry, a 0 in the 2's place. And I have a 1 in the 1's place. This is expanded form. Okay? We're writing each number next to what it's actually worth in that place. And then we multiply. So this is 1 times 2 cubed. Well, 2 cubed is 8, so this is 8. I have 0 and 0, and then I have a 1. This in base 2 is the number 9 in base 10. Okay, so base 12, it's no different. 
It's a different system, but the process is all still the same. I have three values, so I'm going to write three placeholders. I do have a T, and I'm going to write what T means because we're working in our system to try to figure this out, right? What does T mean? It means 10. Yeah, W would mean 12. This one's 10, so it's a 10. A T is 10. And I have zeros. In base 12, I have powers of 12. So this is the place value 1, the place value 12, and the place value of 12 squared. And if I had another one, it'd be 12 cubed. And then I'd have 12 to the 4th. It'd just be powers of 10, or 12, sorry. And then you're going to multiply each of them. So this is 10 times 12 squared plus 0 times 12 plus 0 times 1. And do you have to write the 0 times things? No, you don't have to write them. But I don't want you to think that for some reason that I'm leaving them out for another purpose. Okay, what is 12 squared, do you know? 144. It's 144. So this is really 10 times 144, which makes it 1440, right? And plus 0, and 0 again. Write them or don't. This is 1,440 in base 10. Let me make one real quick observation, and I'll make it again next time, too. Whenever the place value or the, place, the base system that you're working in, base 2 to base 10, do you notice that if it's a smaller base, base 2, that the number of digits needed is more? I need four digits for this number in base 2. I only need one digit in base 10. And the same thing happens over here in base 12. Base 12 is a bigger base, so I need fewer digits. I only needed three digits for it to be in base 12, but I needed four digits for it to be in base 10. That's a pattern that always continues. It always has that feature to it. We will finish this lesson next time. So there is no homework from this section assigned. However, that means what should you really, really, really be working on before Friday? Redos. I should come in and get like there's 18 of you, so I should get almost 18 redos. That would be amazing if I could get that on Friday.